Okay, um, this week I have another picture for you and it looks very much like last week's picture. <clears throat> I should have brought last week's picture, but I did not. Um, this is uh, another, another virgin and child. Um, I'm gonna just let you pass it around because it's very distant. This is Duccio. Duccio was a contemporary of Cimabue and Giotto that we talked about that you actually saw mentioned in your purgatory reading for today. He's from Siena, the Italian city of Siena. So if you have looked at the notes at all um, for the Italian guys, shall we say, uh, that he meets, uh, you run into the name Siena, a rival Italian city. Duccio is from there. Um, this painting was probably delivered in 1286, also painted during the lifetime of Dante. So I mean, things are really changing, and this is very early. You know, if you, if you ask someone, when is the Renaissance? People say, oh, the 1400s, the 1500s, the 1600s. But this is, this is before 1300. Art is changing, and we have this amazing guy who decided to write in Italian an epic poem. So thing, things are really uh, changing. So, you know, time periods in history don't just suddenly happen, do they? You know, you don't wake up, oh, I, it, it's not like January 1st after New Year's Eve, it's like, oh, it's a new year, oh, it's the Renaissance. Oh. <laughs> that was very, very dangerous. Uh, oh, Addison. Yes, I mean, this, do you, have you noticed, first of all, how many references there are to Greek and Roman mythology? They're already really, really, uh, let's say, Renaissance means rebirth, right? So they're r r giving birth again, or, you know, knowledge of Greece and Rome is really blossoming. Um, it's not full out, remember, when Dante is writing, there is still a Roman emperor on the throne in Constantinople. It hasn't fallen yet. When that happens, though, they're all going to run for it. They're going to run for it. They're going to grab every Greek book they can get their hands on and head west. And it's just going to be dumped on Europe, and people are going to be amazed, and they're going to start learning Greek again. But even at this point, they've sort of got the idea that, you know, they're rediscovering the writings of Cicero, for example, and they're saying, He's a model of Latin composition. I wish our Latin, because remember, they were still writing in Latin. We always think of, oh, Latin is a dead language. It died with the Romans. No, it didn't. Just a couple hundred years ago, what, 250 years ago, Isaac Newton wrote his treatise on gravity in Latin. Um, so, but they rediscovered really nice Latin style. It's like if uh, we all turned into people who say, Gunna and Imna and stuff like that. And then we rediscovered the language of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. You know, and we said, oh, those people knew how to speak English. Let's all talk like them. This is what they were doing. Like, let's all be Cicero. Let's all write Latin like Cicero. And they were all excited about it. Um, so it was, it was the beginning of that, but it's going to blossom full force when we get to like Michelangelo and Da Vinci and artists that we know the names of. Um, next week's imitation is much longer. Little bit of a challenge. It is the opening paragraph of The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. I do not care what you use as your subject. I used um, ants at a picnic. Um, so there, the H.G. Wells' first sentence, no one would have believed in the last years of the 19th century that this world was being watched keenly and closely by intelligences greater than man's and yet as mortal as his own. I, this is a very long sentence, so I'm not going to go on. Mine is no bug would have believed in the early hours of the summer afternoon that this blanket was being hu observed hungrily and eagerly by appetites greater than the ants, and yet as gnawing as his own. So the ants are going to crash somebody's picnic in, instead of aliens invading. 
So it might be helpful for you to think of a situation in which some unwanted entity is coming into someone else's domain, because that's what's happening in the paragraph. However, if you want to do something other than that, you go for it. All right. But surely you could all think of some situation. It could also be a fictional situation. I mean, my picnic was technically fictional, but I mean, it could be from a book or a movie. You know, just think of someone or something coming in. It could be your sibling coming unwelcomely into your room. I don't care. But it's going to take a little doing. So don't put it off. If you are the person who possibly is putting this off until Mondays, don't do that. Work on it a little bit this week because it's much longer. But I have great confidence in all of you. I, you've given me some great stuff. Um, OK, let's take a look at the purgatory. And as promised, does anybody have a question about my questions? Was there a question I asked that you just spent all week searching for? Bridle. Oh, rain. I shouldn't have called it a bridle. The whip and the rain. Is bri a bridle is a rain, the same thing. I'm sorry that I phrased it like that. Um, I must have written my questions out of a, di a different translation. And then I switched to this one, and that one used bridle. So what, what is the whip? of each cornice? Does anybody can answer? Yeah. So the and, and you didn't really see one until you got to the cornice of pride. You know, all those anti-purgatory before the gate places didn't have it. But when they got onto um, the level of pride, the cornice of pride, there were examples. I'm going to, later this morning, I want to take a look at them more closely. Um, they show you examples of not having the sin. They spur you on to not be proud because they show humble people. What is the rain or the bridle? The, yeah, examples of the sin um, that say, don't be like this. This is ugly, don't be like this. And from here on out, well, through those seven cornices, you'll see one every time. But bridal means rain. Um, any other questions about my questions? Because I can't promise that we will go over them, because I have my own agenda. Um, OK, let's dig in. I want to point out something. <sighs> my problems, Addison, problems. Um, on, uh, in Canto 7, they are uh, with the negligent rulers. We're going to come back and take a look at those in a little bit. But night falls. Was there day and night in hell? Somehow Virgil knew what time it was. Do you know? Sometimes he said, oh, the star that rose then is setting now, and we need to get a move on. Like, Virgil, how do you know? You're in the middle of the earth. How do you know? He knows. But here, there's actually day and night, and they can see sun, and they can see stars. Yeah, Dominic. Maybe. There's just something they know there. But here, it's actually physical. There's day, and the sun comes up, because it's actually a mountain in the real, in the air, in the real world. But he gets to this cornice, this ledge. They're not through the gate yet. And everybody just stops. Um, and he meets someone there, and it says that this, this person says, But the day is fading fast, and in no case may one ascend at night. We will do well to give some thought to a good resting place. What is it you say? My guide asked. If one sought to climb at night, would others block his way? Or would he simply find that he could not? Once the sun set, sun sets, that noble soul replied, you could not cross this line and ran his finger across the ground between him and my guide. Nor is there anything to block the ascent except the shades of night. They of themselves suffice to sap the will of the most fervent. One might indeed go down during the night and wander the whole slope where he inclined to. 
while the horizon locks the day from sight. Um, what, I, if you looked at the notes, you already know. What could Dante mean by saying that the mount of purgatory can only be climbed during the day, and when the night comes, you just can't, you just can't go up, no matter how hard you want to. What do you think? Like in Ecclesiastes, there's a time for everything. So there, our lives have a rhythm, don't they? I mean, we have a daily rhythm. We all need to sleep. You know, lack of sleep is fatal. Did you guys know that? Have I told you that before? If you keep someone awake long enough, they will die of it. That's horrifying. Um, so so let's, let's build on that. If our physical lives have a rhythm, right? We work and then we rest and we work and then we rest. What about our spiritual lives? If this is also to be taken as not simply Dante's cool trip up a mountain, but it's a spiritual, like our spirits moving towards God, do our spiritual lives have a rhythm? Do you know what I mean by that? Like are we always super rejoicing in God all the time? I mean, it'd be lovely if we were, but let's be honest. We're, we're not. Do you ever do you ever pray and you you just don't feel it? Yeah, and we feel a little guilty because we know we should feel it, but you do it anyway because God says pray and we do it right, and you trust it it will come back right. So I think that's very that's very insightful. Um, is there anything else? <clears throat> what? <clears throat> What does the sun, maybe, if the sun was a symbol of something, what might the sun be the symbol of? Think about what the sun is <coughs> and what it does and what could it be? What do you think? God's light, right? Jesus told us we are the light of the world, right? And he's the, the true light that gives light to every man. So if the sun is God's, I don't know, grace, God's power. What happens to you at night if God's grace and power isn't there? Can you make any spiritual progress without him? You can't climb the mountain. If the mountain is get rid of my sin, right, be purified of my sin, I can't do it without him. Um, I wrote this down in the margin. Uh, this is John 12:35. Oh, I'm sorry. No, this is John 9, 4. Night is coming when no one can work. And then now this is John 12. Walk while you have the light, that the darkness overtake you not. And he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. You can't make progress in the dark. I think maybe both of those Dominic's idea, my idea, and probably ideas we're not even exploring were in, in Dante's mind. These people have a rhythm, and they're bound to that rhythm because God wills the rhythm. He created day and night, right? And it was evening and morning the first day. So, um, but you've got to wait for God. These, these souls have to wait for God. They can't make any progress without him. So they just hold up. What do you think could be meant by you can go back down, but you can't go further up at night. You can, what we would call, backslide. You can move away from him, but you can't get any closer, not without his help. Does that make sense? It's a really cool touch because, you know, in Inferno, they were, as we said, under the ground. There's no sun. And here he's got the benefit for the story of, well, I'm on a mountain. There's day and night. How about I use it? Oh, we'll say you can't make progress up the mountain during the night. God's grace has to be shining on you. Um, cool touch. Um, okay, let's. I'm going to just go back to the beginning of purgatory and grab some of the stuff. I want to get my time.
behind so I can see it. Okay. Um, Canto one, our, our editor reminds us that it's Easter weekend. The poets emerge from hell just before dawn of Easter Sunday. It's perfect. They arise to new life and Dante comes out under the last word of Inferno, stars. And in Canto 1, he sees four stars. It says, I turned then to my right and my mind on the other pole, and there I saw four stars unseen by mortals since the first mankind. The heavens seemed to revel in their light. O oh, widowed northern hemisphere, bereft forever of the glory of that sight. Okay, first of all, literally. Can we see stars that are only visible in the southern hemisphere? No. Like in Italy, they can't see well, the southern cross is the only constellation I have any knowledge of in the southern hemisphere. You know, my daughter is in New Zealand right now, as I keep bragging about. And so it's all different stars. It's all, none of our constellations are there. So literally, he says, well, four stars unseen by mortals since the first mankind. Well, because there's supposedly no land there. But there is something that comes in a set of four. I have no better way to ask this question. And that's, n there are a lot of things that come in a set of four, so. That's really not going to get the answer. The, the cardinal virtues, um, uh, justice, prudence, temperance, and fortitude. Right? These are the virtues, the four main virtues of the ancient world, you know, like Aristotle and Plato wrote about. I think we know what they all mean, justice, prudence, you know, wisdom, um, temperance, not overindulging in anything, and fortitude, you know, being brave and strong. What do you think Dante could mean by four stars, four virtues, never seen since the first mankind? What is his opinion of people? Yeah, even though we look at people like, uh, you know, Cato that we're going to meet here shortly and, and the great stoic philosophers and things, and we think of them having great fortitude. And, but Dante said, well, you know, maybe, but they don't have it in its fullness since Adam and Eve. Now, he sees these four stars. Yeah, Dominic, go ahead. Yes, yes. Um, he sees three more stars. Um, he looks at another, this is later. Um, my son, what is it that you stare at so? And I, at those three stars there, in whose light the polar regions here are all aglow. And he to me, below the rim of space now ride the four bright stars you saw this morning. They've gone below the horizon. And these three have risen in their place. Can you think of three virtues that replace or add to the four? Faith, hope, and charity. Faith, hope, and love. They're the theological virtues, the ones we can't have without God, not in their fullness. These mankind works towards, you know, and some of the ancients seem pretty strong, but seven we need. So the four set, but those three, and it says they're so bright, the heavens seem to revel in their light. They're even better than the four stars. So everything, the reason I'm telling you all this stuff we're talking about a hundredth of the stuff that he's buried in this poem. Do you know what I mean? I have a feeling we could just read this poem twice a year, every year for the rest of our lives, and then every time we'd think, oh, I never knew that. I never, I never saw that before. That's how good this poem is. Um, uh, you know, I already turned away from that page, but I wanted to mention something else that happens in your reading this week in general. Uh, that when he asked when Virgil, uh, when the guy told Virgil 
you can't climb here at night. What is it you say? My guide asked. If one sought to climb at night, would others block his way? Why does Virgil not know how this works? Why does Virgil not know how things work here? Because he hasn't been before. He's never been here before. This is new territory for him. He apparently went through all the levels of hell once upon a time. He's familiar with this. He knows how things work. But here, he's got to start asking questions. You see him asking, um, um, excuse me, where's the way up to the next level? How, how do I find that? What does Virgil represent? Human knowledge. human knowledge and human reason. Can you reason your way through purging your sin? Like I just, I, you know, I've decided that doing whatever it is, just fill in the blank, whatever besetting sin, it's unhealthy and it's wrong and I'm just not going to do it anymore. There, done. Reason has told me that it is is wicked, or uh, we'll just pick my favorite, gluttony, you know, because it's so obviously unhealthy. It's just so plain. You know, reason tells me that just excess sugar is really, really bad for me, and I have diabetics in my family, and, you know, heart disease, and I'm just not, I'm just, it's very reasonable. But then you wave a cookie in front of my face, or you give me a Whitey's gift card, which please, um, and I am not reasonable anymore. Do you see what I mean? I mean? Human reason is good. It's good to realize that, yes, if my blood sugar goes too high, you know, and I'm diabetic, that leads to a whole host of problems. You don't want that to happen. That's very reasonable, but it doesn't stop me, right? I have to have God's grace. I say, God, help me to take better care of the body that you made for me and you expect me to take care of. Um, so anyway, it's fun. As you finish reading Purgatory, watch how many times Virgil has to say, what's the deal with this? What's going on here? Who are you? What is that? Um, because human reason doesn't understand it anymore. Human reason understands something. He's not helpless. Virgil's not an idiot in Purgatory. But he doesn't know everything anymore. It's interesting. Okay. Let's go back. Um, a, a boatman, let's skip through a few things. A boatman takes them across. Um, and do you remember that a boatman also took people across into hell, right? I am going to read, um, I'm going to go back and read the boat trip into hell, just a couple of stanzas. And then I want to read the boat trip to purgatory, and I would like you to compare them. Um, this is Canto 2 of Purgatory, but I'm going back, in our books, I'm going back to page uh, 34 in Inferno. And it says this, um, The steersmen of that marsh of ruined souls who wore a wheel of flame around each eye stifled the rage that shook his woolly jowls. But those unmanned and naked spirits there turned pale with fear, and their teeth began to chatter at sound of his crude bellow. In despair, they blasphemed God, their parents, their time on earth, the race of Adam, and the day and hour and the place and the seed and the womb that gave them birth. But altogether they drew to that grim shore where all must come who lose the fear of God. Weeping and cursing, they come forevermore. And demon Charon with eyes like burning coals herds them in, and with a whistling oar flails on the stragglers to his wake of souls. He beats them if they don't get out of the boat. And what, is it, what are the sounds you would hear? Blaspheming, wailing. This is the entry to hell. Okay, compare. Page 297, entry to purgatory. Astern stood the great pilot of the Lord. So fair his blessedness seemed written on him, and more than a hundred souls were seated forward, singing as if they raised a single voice in Exitu Israel de Egipto. Um, 
when Israel uh, left Egypt, basically. Verse after verse, they made the air rejoice. The angel made the sign of the cross, and they cast themselves at his signal to the shore. Then swiftly as he had come, he went away. What are they doing when they arrive? They're praising God. They're singing a psalm. A psalm about the exodus. Because they're leaving the world of sin behind. They're on their way to God. They have a little cleanup process to do, but they're on the way. The exodus is happening for them. They're on their way to the promised land. Uh, and, and instead of a demon boatman, they have a beautiful angel. It's the same scene. It's completely different. Because don't forget, don't ever forget, these people are already in heaven. They're just not capable of beholding God's glory yet. Like they're physically not capable. They can't handle it until they have a little cleanup process. Then they'll be able to handle it. Um, okay, so they, they head out, and um, I'm going to skip over a couple of these cantos. We meet the excommunicated, the indolent, the lazy. Um, remember, these are people who let something keep them from pursuing God. So excommunication, obviously, they didn't seal, seek reconciliation with the church till the very end. Um, laziness speaks for itself. Like this is us whenever we're too lazy to pray, we're too lazy to read our Bibles, we're too lazy to go to church. Like I just don't want to. I just don't want to. But remember, at the end of their lives, they called out to God. God, have mercy on me. Forgive me. And okay, yeah. But yeah, you did a lot of damage to your soul. All those years, we're going to have to undo that damage. So now you have to wait to undo the damage you did. This, the ledge of the indolent, the lazy, um, uh, it says, Such is this mount, that when a soul begins the lower slopes, it must most labor. Then less and less, the more it nears its goal. Thus, when we reach the point where the slope seems so smooth and gentle, that the climb becomes as easy as to float a skiff downstream, then will this road be run and not before. Uh, not before that journey's end will your repose be found. I know this much for truth and say no more. Um, we turned together uh, to the sound someone called to them, and there close on our left we saw a massive boulder of which till then we had not been aware. To it we dragged ourselves and there we found stretched in the shade the way a slovenly man lies down to rest and people on the ground they had to drag themselves to the next ledge because it's the ledge of the lazy people they lay on the ledge of the lazy people oh my god I'm so tired yes it's the lazy people but is there another reason maybe that the bottom of the mountain is harder to climb than the top? What do you think? What, much more of what and less of what? Sin. Sin is like a, you know, like a bowling ball shackled to your ankle or something, you know? The more you get rid of, the lighter you get and the faster you can go. So they get a double whammy here. First of all, they're at the very bottom, almost at the very bottom, and they're on the ledge where the lazy people are. Okay. Um, all right. Third class, people who died suddenly by violence and the, the unshriven. Uh, there was no time for confession and, you know, extreme unction or final rites or anything. They just, there was no time to clean things up with God. They just were taken out before they knew what hit them, I suppose. Um, yes, as Christians, but, but, they, but not sinless because none of us are sinless, right? And so presumably, I don't know. 
I don't know. Maybe some of you have lost sick or elderly family members. If I were on my deathbed and I knew I were going to die really soon, you know, I would probably want to confess my sins. I would probably be doing a lot of praying. Do you know what I mean? But if it just suddenly hits you, you can't really, you know. Um, that was these guys. Um, and they're all looking at Dante. It's so fun on Purgatory because there's sun. And what does sun create when solid bodies get in its way? Shadows. Dante makes a shadow. But the souls don't. And it freaks them out. They're like, dude, that guy has a shadow. I think that guy has a shadow. So Dante keeps using this all over because it's, it's just, they're all amazed. Oh, look at him. Look at him. He has a shadow. So this happens here on this, on this ledge. And oh, look, look there. See how the sun's shafts do not drive through to the left of that one lower down, and he walks as if he were alive? And so Dante says, what? Well, he was talking about me. He was talking about me. At which my master said, why do you lag? What has so turned your mind that you look back? What is it to you that idle tongues will wag? Follow my steps, though all such whisper of you. Be as a tower of stone, its lofty crown unswayed by anything the winds may do. For when a man lets his attention range toward every wisp, he loses true direction, sapping his mind's force with continual change. I feel like this is pretty plain. What happens to us when we care about people's opinions? Yeah. Both, both of the above, yes and yes. First of all, look how he's like, Dante's like, oh, who's talking about me? It doesn't matter who's talking about you. Move along. But um, what, what, did, what was yours, Neil? Oh, your and, and change your opinion. You might be swayed by other people if you don't keep the goal in sight. It's like, oh, I wonder what they think I should do. Um, this was on the bottom of page 320 and the top of 321. Uh, yeah, if we're going to follow God, can you guys think of a story from the Gospels super looming large in my head right now? What about him, Lord? Do you know the story I'm thinking of? One of the disciples said, well, what about him? Do you remember? Uh, when I start telling it, it will come back to you. We all remember this. Peter denied Jesus three times. We know this. And after the resurrection, Jesus asked him three times, Peter, do you love me? Do you remember the story? And this is in the book of John. It says that the disciple whom Jesus loved, it's John, was following not too far behind. I think John was eavesdropping. This is my personal opinion. I want to see what Jesus says to Peter. Maybe he was just there. I feel like he was there. And Peter turns around and he says, well, what about him? Do you remember what Jesus told him? What does it matter to you if he stays here till I come again? You follow me. What does it matter to you if, I don't, if he just lives forever? Jesus has just said, Peter, when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone will lead you where you do not want to go. You're going to die. Well, what about him? We're not talking about him. This is Jesus' answer. You follow me. My deal with him is my deal with him. This is my deal with you. It does. So the disciples sound like siblings a lot. Like they're fighting on the road. Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Seriously, are you kidding me? This is what Jesus. I feel like Jesus did a lot of. <sighs> I feel like this was a, this was a look on Jesus' face. Um, the, the mom, the mom look. Um, yeah, and and John goes on to say. There's therefore a rumor going around that that disciple would not ever die. And he said, Jesus didn't say that disciple would never die. He said, what is it to you if I want him to remain? Although interestingly, John 
lived longer than all the rest and had the vision of the apocalypse and um, did technically stay till Jesus came again because he saw it um, in Revelation. But uh, anyway, I've strayed very far from the topic, which is Virgil telling Dante, stop turning your head at everybody who twitters over the fact that you've got a shadow. It's really not something to be that proud of. Everybody with a body has a shadow. <clears throat> Move along. Um, okay, in the same canto, this is the people who died um, by uh, violence. We meet, and you don't know this unless you look in the notes, um, on page 323, line uh, 94 or so. I am Bon Conte, once of Montefeltro. He introduces himself. It so happens this is the son of Guido da Montefeltro, um, who was, is an evil counselor. Um, is in, in the even counselor fires. And uh, this is really interesting. I want to read to you about this guy's dad. All right, I'm going back to page 214. We didn't read this when we went through the first time. Okay. I'm going to start on page 213. Okay, at the bottom, okay, at the bottom, actually at the bottom of 213, I'm not going to read it. Here's the deal. This guy's dad, Guido, told that the Pope came to him, one of the wicked popes, and said, I need help getting this family, this city, whatever, to do my will. And Guido, at the top of page 214, said, long promise and short observance is the road that leads to the sure triumph of your throne. Long promise, make a lot of promises. Short observance, don't keep your promises. Promise them anything and then stick it to them. That was his evil advice. The Pope, on the bottom of page 213, said, hey, you know what, I'm the Pope. I absolve you in advance for giving me bad advice. Yeah, well, it's not that easy as Guido finds out, because on page 214, line 109, later when I was dead, St. Francis came to claim my soul. But one of the black angels said, leave him. Do not wrong me. This one's name went into my book the moment he resolved to give false counsel. Since then, he has been mine. For who does not repent cannot be absolved. Nor can we admit the possibility of repenting a thing at the same time it is willed, for the two acts are contradictory. If you don't, aren't sorry for a sin, it can't be forgiven. And you can't do it and be sorry for it at the same time. If you're sorry for it, you wouldn't do it. You can't say, oh, oh, I'm going to do this wicked thing, forgive me. You're going to do it, you're not sorry for it. That doesn't work that way. So this demon says to St. Francis, uh, no, his soul's mine. I'm not, I think because he was in the Franciscan order. The evil counselor was a Franciscan. Um, Miserable me, with what contrition I shuddered when he lifted me, saying, perhaps you hadn't heard I was a logician. Maybe you didn't know Satan knows logic. Yeah, law of non-contradiction. You can't, a thing can't be and not be at the same time in the same way. Uh, yeah, I know logic. Come along. So Guido tells the story of how the, the, good spirit and the wicked spirit came to snatch his soul and had a little argument and the wicked would won. Now, back to page 324. This is the guy's son. He's there with the um, uh, died by violence. Um, line 106. There my sight failed. There with a final moan, which was the name of Mary, speech went from me. I fell and there my body lay alone. I speak the truth. Oh, speak it in my name to living men. God's angel took me up, and hell's cried, Why do you steal my game? It's the same thing with the son. If his immortal part is your catch, brother, 
for one squeezed tear that makes me turn it loose. I've got another treatment for the other. This demon is so angry. He's like, are you kidding me? You're stealing him because he cried out at the last moment before he died for God's mercy for one squeezed tear. He says, well, if the immortal part is yours, I'm going to do something with the part that's mortal. And uh, he washes his body down the river so it's lost in the swamp and they can't find his body ever to bury it. That's all they can do. Can't touch his soul. I love this. I love this because God is so merciful, right? The least crying out to him at the last minute. It's like, okay, okay, awesome. You're mine. Um, Dante was so smart. He does the father and the son, and he tells exactly the same story, but with a different result. This time, the angel, the angelic forces get his, get his soul, and not the demons. Um, oh, let me see what time it is. Let's skip up a little bit. Um, let's go up to the canto of the negligent rulers. Now, what does it mean to be negligent? Is it not know what you're doing, or is it something a little different? Ignoring what you should be doing. If you're negligent, you should have known and done something, but you just purposely didn't, didn't, didn't know it or do it. What does, what does negligent ruler sound like? What does it, if I say he was a negligent ruler, what does it sound like? Yeah, someone who wasn't a very good ruler. But in this case, it doesn't mean that. They were so wrapped up in being rulers, they were negligent towards God. Most of them. Does that make sense? So, um, you know, I never, I never have time to go to church because, you know, I got a lot of responsibility here. I've got all these people counting on me, and I can't take the time. I just can't take the time. And it sounds very reasonable. Well, he is. He's the king. He's very busy. His subjects need him. They need his help. But they, they use it as an excuse to not really spend time with God, to not really work on their spiritual state. So now they have to wait like they made God wait. Um, so those are the negligent rulers. But there's one of them um, that's different. Um, and I want to read the note on him. It says, and the, the soul that Sordello is the one they're with, and he's pointing out all of them, you know, all the famous kings of history. It's like, there's so-and-so, there's, you know, there's this guy and that guy and that guy. See Henry of England, seated there alone, the monarch of the simple life. His branches came to good issue in a noble son. It's like, okay, you think, all right, so, so Henry, which Henry? I don't know, there's a million Henrys everywhere. In England and France, everybody's Henry. Um, but if we look in the note, Henry of England. Henry III, a pious but pallid king. His son Edward I, however, crowned a glorious reign with enduring for reform of English law. Henry is seated alone in part, perhaps, because he had no connection with the Holy Roman Empire. England was just sort of its own thing. But much more importantly, <coughs> because he is unique in this company, Henry attended so many masses daily that he never got around to governing his kingdom. <laughs> his sin, therefore, could not have been neglect of God, but rather neglect of his divinely imposed duties. So what Addison said at first, it applies here. Um, you end up here if you spend all of your time ruling and none of it with God. You end up here if you spend all your time with God and none of it ruling. It seems like you could never go to too many church services. Do you know what I mean? It almost seems like how, how, could, you, how could you overdo serving God? But what if... Like I've used this example before. What if you have, your, your mother is very, very ill, 
she's critically ill and you're her caretaker but you you don't want to take the time it's like well you know she's crying out it's time for her medication well I'm sorry it's my time for prayer now don't don't you think if you missed church because your mom was critically ill and needed meds that God would understand that and that maybe honor your father and your mother in this case applies what were you going to say Dominic yeah and these people were unbalanced not mentally unbalanced their their lives were out of balance because there's a time it seems to be a theme running through today um, unexpectedly there's a time for action and then there's a time for contemplation there's a time to pray and spend time with God and there's a time to actually do your job you know your mom is not going to appreciate it if if you, she said do the dishes and then you don't do the dishes like oh I was praying no do the dishes I mean okay every mom would be happy to hear you were praying I'll be totally honest but like maybe if you listen to God during that prayer, God would whisper to you, go do the dishes because <laughs> you're supposed to obey your mother. So it's really interesting that it, it swings both directions. And actually, do you guys remember, um, this was in Bede's ecclesiastical history. Um, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. This is King Alfred, um, Alfred the Great. So King Alfred the Great of England had a brother who was like this. Do you remember this? And um, I don't know if we talked about it here. We talked to the junior high kids, talked about it. And uh, there was a big battle against the Saxons. They were all lined up waiting, and his brother was at mass. And the soldiers are on the battlefield, and the Saxons are about to attack, and they're waiting for his brother to get out of church. No, no, go out there and defend your kingdom. There really have been kings like this. So apparently Henry III of England was a very pious man, that's lovely, but you, you actually need to do some ruling if God made you king, don't you? Okay. Um, he has a dream, if you remember, and um, he dreams that an eagle swooped down and carried him up to the gate of purgatory, and then he finds out Lucia has actually swooped down. Um, you might remember that Mary called Lucia. And Lucia called Beatrice. You know, we learned this in Canto 1 of Inferno 2. Um, Mary said, you know what? Beatrice has a follower down there. He's ver faring very poorly. Lucia, uh, patron saint of uh, clear eyesight and light, you know, go tell Beatrice he needs help. Lucia swoops down and um, takes him to the front step. And I want to spend some time taking a look at this front step. Um, I saw a great gate I'm on page 360 if anybody wants it I saw a great gate fixed in place above three steps each its own color and a guard who did not say a word and did not move slow bit by bit raising my lids with care I made him out seated on the top step his face more radiant than my eyes could bear he held a drawn sword, and the eye of day beat such a fire back from it that each time I tried to look at it, I had to look away. I mean, Dante, at this point, can't even handle the look of the angels. He's certainly in no shape to handle God, right? The glory of the angel, the lowest angel on Mount Purgatory, is blinding him. I heard him call, what is your business here? Answer from where you stand. Where is your guide? Take care you do not find your coming dear. What are, you, are you supposed to, am I supposed to let you in? Are you supposed to be here? He holds a drawn sword. Does that remind you of anything? Maybe. So that man could not go back to paradise. The angel holds a sword. Are you supposed to come back? Are you supposed to come back? A little while ago, my teacher said, a heavenly lady, well-versed in these matters, told us, go there. That is the gate ahead. And may she still assist you once inside, your soul's good. Come forward to our three steps, the courteous keeper of the gate replied. We came to the first step. White marble 
gleaming, so polished and so smooth that in its mirror I saw my true reflection past all seeming. Step one, white marble. It's so gorgeously polished you can see yourself in it. The second was stained darker than blue-black and of a rough grained and a fire-flaked stone, its length and breadth crisscrossed by many a crack. The third and topmost was of porphyry, or it, so it seemed, but of as red, of a red as flaming as blood that spurts out of an artery. Porphyry is a red stone, not red as blood, but, you know, sort of a maroon color. All right, we have three steps. Some of you might be very familiar with this. So, to start to lay aside my sin, to be sorry for my sin, Three steps. Do any of you know what I mean? Wait, do you want to tell me? What are the th the the Okay, okay, that's beautiful, beautiful. So first act, we we'll call it contrition, right? Dominic said it perfectly. See yourself for what you really are. Look in the mirror. Man, I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. That was ugly. That thing I did was ugly, right? Then confession, all right? Like, I have to tell, for Catholic tradition, tell the priest, which is the same as telling God. So tell God, you know. Protestants do it directly, and Catholic tradition, the priest stands in for God, right? Because since we have bodies, it's nice to actually say words to somebody and have somebody say words, you know, you are forgiven. Um, but it's the same idea. You got to out it, right? You got to out it somehow. You got to identify it and out it. And then the red, you've got to, what was the last thing you said? Show. Penance. So, um, uh, so the fiery, like, ardor, um, um, I'm on fire to correct this, right? So it's like Zacchaeus. He's, he sees himself for what he really is when Jesus comes to visit. And he says, if I've defrauded anyone, right, I return it fourfold. He has defrauded someone. He's a tax collector. Synonymous. This is how they make their living by defrauding people. And what does he do? He does his, we'll call it penance. I'm, I will return it fourfold, right? So you got to go through the steps, right? If you don't do anything, if you just keep doing it over and over, you're not really sorry, if you know what I mean. Although we do do the same things over and over. Like, don't beat yourself up when that happens. But presumably, we get better. Do you know what I mean? If we, if we ask God's help, God, I really want to conquer this whatever, this sharp tongue I have. And I just smart off all the time. And that's just ugly. I wouldn't want to do that. Well, you're probably going to keep smarting off a few times, you know, and every time you say, sorry, God, I did it again. But eventually, presumably, you, you'll hold it back. But sometimes, you know, what might be your ardor, like I really want to say something and I'm just not saying a word. I've already decided I'm going to this family get-together or this meeting or whatever, and I've already decided in advance, not saying anything, I'm just going to listen this time, right? That's my, that's my medicine sort of. So he goes up these steps of, uh, you know, the acts of contrition. And it says, um, with great goodwill, my master guided me up the three steps and whispered in my ear, I'm at the top of page 361, now beg him humbly that he turn the key. Devoutly prostrate at his holy feet, I begged in mercy's name to be let in, but first three times upon my breast I beat. Do you know what he's doing? What is it? If you, yeah, yeah, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Um, seven P's, like the letter P, the scars, seven scars of sin, his sword cut into my brow, carved seven P's. Peccatum is the Latin word for sin. Seven peccata. He said, scrub off these wounds when you have passed within. Color of ashes, of parched earth, one sees deep in an excavation were his vestments. 
Why does the gatekeeper of purgatory have ash-colored clothes? Renewal. Well, when is a time ashes are very popular? <laughs> I'll just say. This is true. When do we use ashes for something? Ash Wednesday. This is, Dominic, you're too deep for my question. That's the problem. I was asking something very service, and you're just like, oh, it's the circle of life, and the ashes bring you. Yes. Totally yes. But, um, Again, is it either or? No, it's both and. He means both. Um, so he's the color of penitence. His clothes are the color of penitence. And he drew out from beneath them two keys. One was of gold, one of silver. He applied the white one first to the gate and then the yellow and did with them what left me satisfied. In other words, he opened the gate for me. Whenever either of these keys is put improperly in the lock and fails to turn it, the angel said to us, the door stays shut. One is more precious. The other is so wrought as to require the greater skill and genius, for it is the one that, which unties the knot. This angel has the keys of Peter, basically. He's got two of them. He's got one that's very precious, the authority to forgive sin. He's got one that takes greater skill to use, wisdom in knowing how to treat a sick soul, right? So you go to confession, and you know you have the, the authority, all right, to forgive sin. But like, okay, so what shall I say to this sinner that has confessed this? What should they do now? What medicine? It's like being a doctor. What medicine does this person need to get well? So he's got two keys. I got to turn them both. Um, they are from Peter, and he bade me be more eager to let in than keep out whoever casts himself prostrate before me. Then opening the sacred portals wide, enter. Be for, but first be warned, do not look back, or you will find yourself once more outside. Jesus said the same thing, didn't he? Whoever puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy of me. Once you've decided, that I'm following Jesus. Don't go back. Don't look back. Um... The gate squeaks and roars as it opens. At the first thunderous roll, I turned half around, for it seemed to me I heard a chorus singing Te Deum Laudamus, mixed with that sweet sound. We praise you, Lord. Why are they all praising all the souls? Because somebody's joining us. The gates are opening. It's a new soul on his way. It's on his way. And they all rejoice. Did, did the souls in hell seem to rejoice over anything that happened to anyone else? Well, did, plain old, did they rejoice over anything, period? I don't really think they rejoiced ever over it. Oh, except maybe eating the other guy. <laughs> Not a very pleasant thing. Um, no, they kind of like to see one of the other souls catch it. Yeah, you know what I mean? If it meant they weren't catching it at the moment. These all praise God every time someone joins them because they're so happy. Um, so the very first sound Dante hears in purgatory proper inside the gate is praises of the saints. Um, the very first sound he heard in the inferno, sighs and cries and wails coiled and recoiled on the starless air, spilling my soul to tears. A confusion of tongues and monstrous accents toiled in pain and anger. Voices hoarse and shrill and sounds of blows, all intermingled, raised tumult and pandemonium that still, that whirls on the air forever dirty with it, as if a whirlwind sucked at sand. Nasty. I like the blows thrown in there, kind of when they're hitting each other. And here we sing psalms every time someone comes in. It's the first thing you hear. All right, so now they are in. They are in purgatory. And um, we spend the whole rest of the reading, the last three cantos that you read, on pride. Again, why do you think pride's at the bottom of the mountain? Yeah. 
it is really, really hard to deal with pride. And most of the other things I do that are wicked are because of my pride. Go ahead, Gabriel. And pride is actually the reason that the devil is being the devil. It is. I mean, it's just the, 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 big, the biggest of the seven sins. It is, it, is, it is big. It is big because it is the origin of all other sin. It is the original sin, as far as Satan's sin, that he wasn't, he thought he was better than he was. He, he deserved more honor. Then he was getting. And uh, C.S. Lewis is so eloquent about this. I know I've mentioned this, that he, he said it's just insidious because the moment you are obedient to God, you know, you do something that um, is good, and there's that moment of, look at me, I did something good, that we've got to somehow learn to fight down. It's like a, um, Jesus' parable where the servant who obeys the master said, I was just doing my duty. Like when I'm obedient to the, to the Lord, you know, says a slave, I'm simply doing my duty. If I obey Jesus, I'm doing my minimum duty. It's really not something to be proud of. But the moment I do it, you know, like I give alms, I, you know, whatever, like, look at me. I got up early today to pray. And I'm not saying, I mean, hopefully I'm not so far gone that I spend the rest of the day patting myself on the back. But it, there's a moment. Well, look at me. And you've got to catch it because it's so insidious. Yeah, Dominic. Sure. Oh, so is it Simeon Stylites? Maybe. There were several Stylites, but yeah, Pillar, yeah, Pillar yeah, Saints, yes. Um, so this is a weird, I, I guess this is a weird thing to tell you, but I will. So when I was a little girl, I was just really, really into Jesus coming back. Not that I'm not into it now, but you know what I mean? Like I really thought it was going to happen very, very soon. <clears throat> and I think I've told some of you that I, when I lived in Alaska, a volcano erupted and I got up and there was this like this blue green cloud in the sky and I went back in and I'm like, mom, Jesus is coming Anyway, so I got this impression when I was very little that I would live to see Jesus come back. Sort of like Simeon and Anna, you know, like I will. The older I get, the more I'm thinking, you know, it's probably like a six-year-old imagination saying, you're special. You know, but, but I had that for a while. I had that, you know, I've, it has specially been revealed to me that I, within my lifetime, you know, Jesus, you know, and now I'm thinking, Maybe not so much. Maybe I was just a silly little kid who was really into it. But, um, but yeah, if you thought that some grace had been given you, a special grace had been given you, the first thing you're going to do, that's just our human minds. The go-to is, look how special I am. I must be certainly above average, you know, and you fall into it. So pride is what they've got to confront first. Um, <clears throat> they've got to deal with it. And we, we meet for the first time this whip and bridle, which I accidentally called bridle the rain. Um, the whip of pride, examples of humility, in other words. We have Mary. Mary is also always the first example of everything, right? Um, who, um, it's the Annunciation. He sees pictures. He sees these pictures. They're like Harry Potter pictures, you know? Like they're almost moving live living pictures he almost can hear it and 
you know, and smell it and see it moving around, but it doesn't. So we have the Annunciation. We have, second of all, David dancing in front of the Ark. Do you remember this story? They were bringing the Ark of the Covenant up into Jerusalem after Jerusalem had been conquered. And it says he danced around just in his tunic, danced before the Lord. And if you remember, his wife, Saul's daughter, didn't think too much of this. It's like, what kind of jerk am I married to? He's the king for crying out loud. Look, he's making a spectacle of himself. And God did not like that. It said he, God struck her barren, and she was barren until the day of her death. She never had children. Because she, in her, she didn't even say it. I mean, just in her mind, in her heart, she mocked David. Just being humble before God. Um, and then the last one is Trajan. Trajan was a Roman emperor. And uh, the story in this whip is the, is the old story told about him that once upon a time he was on his way out to a campaign, um, to a military campaign. And a widow flung herself in, her, in his path and said, I've been wronged. You need to do justice for me. And Trajan said, um, y yeah, I'm on my way to a war. I have attendants who can deal with that. She says, well, what, what if they don't give me justice? And you know, what if I don't get satisfaction? Well, I can do it when I get back. Well, what if you don't come back? And so in this whip, it says, Trajan says, be assured, for it is clear this duty is to do before I go. Justice halts me. Pity finds me here. Remember, pity and piety are the same word in Italian. Piety, my duty to God, binds me here. The guy was the Roman emperor at the height of the Roman Empire. And they say he got down on, off his horse and heard the widow out and went and took care of business before he left humble, right? Notice we have an example, um, always an example of a Mary. We have another biblical example and a pagan example, right? Um, the examples come from everywhere, all kinds of stories. So that was the whip of pride. Every cornice, every level, the souls have a particular song they sing or prayer they do. It's their prayer, right? And the prayer of the proud is the Lord's Prayer. Although it's embellished a little bit. Um, and you guys read it. Uh, it's like festooning the Lord's Prayer. They, they obviously don't have to pray um, to be delivered from temptation because they really can't sin anymore. They're already in heaven, technically. Um, so they pray for those still on earth. They pray for the others who still can sin. Um, question. <clears throat> and maybe if you read the notes, I got a lot of these from the notes, but maybe from the notes of another book too. What is the first prayer most kids learn? The Lord's Prayer. Yeah, the Our Father. It's, it's just, it's very basic to Christians, right? If you're going to have your child memorize something, the Lord's Prayer is a good place to start. Well, this is true. This is true. But, uh, uh, so in, in, in words, you know, this is the first memorized thing often. So, it, in other words, what class of people Children know how to say the Lord's Prayer, right? Is there any connection in the, in the Gospels, in the New Testament, between childhood and, and humility? Did, what does Jesus have to say about children? Let, let them come to me and hinder them not, for, to such, for such is the kingdom of heaven. There's another story where he said he had a little child brought to him and stood the child in their midst and told them to do something. Told everybody in the crowd to do something. Do you remember what he told them to do? And become like. This is what you should be like. The proud walk around 
saying the very, very basic prayer that even a child knows. Do you see where I'm going with that? It's tailor-made for them because it's like, oh man, this is very elementary. There are five-year-olds that say the Lord's Prayer. Here I am, say the Lord's Prayer. Why? Because you got to be humbled like a little child to get rid of the pride. So they wander around on the point of pride praying the Lord's Prayer. And he meets a guy on page 375. And I find this entertaining. Um, because you know how Dante does. He, he meets people and he says, well, who are you? Can you tell me your story? The guy says, I was Italian, a Tuscan of great fame. Guglielmo Aldobrandesco was my father. I do not know if you've heard the name. He starts out, oh, I was Italian. A, a, a famous Tuscan was my father. And he names him. A famous Tuscan was my father. And then he realizes, watch it. Because what am I about? To, I'm being all proud of my family. Oh, I was Tuscan. My dad was really proud. Oh, yeah. I, I, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, my father. <laughs> he shuts it down immediately. He knows he's got to shut it down. He catches himself. Um, uh, so Dante's very interested in this guy's story. And on page 376, oh, well, by the way, what is the punishment of the pride? Proud. What? No, okay. Ooh, mistake. Never, every time I say punishment, call me out on it. It's the penance or the purging. They are not being punished. The people in Inferno are being punished, okay? They're getting the due punishment that came on them. These people are being purged but it requires some sort of medicine or treatment to purge it. Do you remember what their purging activity is? Uh, they do it crawl around with big rocks on their backs. Crawl around with big, big rocks on their backs. I mean, huge. So they're just bowed down all the way with their faces almost to the ground. In, in fact, the rain of the, the whip and rain in this course are on the ground because these people can't lift up. They can't look up. Um, why? Why would that be a good choice? What do you think the connection may be? Tell me. Yeah. In life, I was very snooty. And now... I can think of another reason, too. I think that's the main reason. Pride is a bit of a burden. Do you know what I mean? Um, like, maintaining your image, curating one's image would be exhausting. I mean, it is exhausting because we all do it a little bit. Um, we all want to be thought of as being a certain type of person, and we have to be kind of careful not to blow it. So for some people, it might involve, you know, how you dress or how you talk or, you know, just where you go. It, it could be anything, you know. Um, social media makes it really hard, right? We all know. I hope you know. If any of you are on Facebook at all, it's not any of it real. I mean, it's they're real people. They're imaginary people. But their lives are not that great. Nobody on Facebook has a life that's any better than yours, honestly. You know what I mean? Like, my daughter is spamming Facebook, according to her brothers, um, with too many pictures of New Zealand right now. Um, Yes, yeah, she's really on that trip, but is her life like that all the time? Oh, oh, heavens no. Oh, heavens no. She has a day job and gets tired of dealing with things just like every other human being. So, you know, you see, you see all the perfect stuff. You know, you're, it's carefully um, curated, and this is a burden. So the prouder you are of who you are and what you have, the more careful you are to make sure nobody knows the real truth or any weakness in you. You know, you don't want to let it get out. Um, so these people are bent down. And listen to this. You know, Dante's talking to one of them, right? And the guy he's talking to is bent down to the ground. So what does Dante have to do to talk to him? Bend down and put his head next to him. I had bowed low, better to know his state when one among them, not he who was speaking, twisted around beneath his crushing weight, saw, saw me, knew me, and cried out. And so he kept his eyes upon me with great effort as I moved with those souls. 
my head bowed low. I told you to look for something last week. Where does Dante do the same thing as the people on that ledge? And it's already happened. He's been down. He doesn't have a big rock on him. But he's bent down low. He is walking around, hunched over. Um, Dante um, was very, it was well known that um, Dante was proud. He was good at what he did. This is really good stuff. Um, in Canto 12, at the beginning, it says, um, I drew myself again, because Virgil says, come along, we, we got to go. I drew myself again to the position required for walking. Thus my body rose, but my thoughts were bent, still bent double in contrition. My thoughts were still down there with him because Dante is proud. Um, oh, it's in these notes. It's where later... Um, I think we'll come across it later. Um, Dante addresses a guy who was a great artist. And he, this guy answers him, Brother, he said, what pages truly shine are Franco Bolognese's. He compliments someone else. Oh, oh, you, you want to know a really good artist? Oh, it's him. This artist is purging his pride. What does he do? He points to someone else. Um, while I was living, I know very well I never would have granted him first place. So great was my heart's yearning to excel. Here pride is paid for. Um, oh, gifted men, vainglorious for first place. How short a time the laurel crown stays green unless the age that follows lacks all grace. You know, you're at the top of the heap. There's going to be somebody coming up behind you to be better than you. Once Chimabui thought to hold the field in painting, and now Giotto has the cry, so that the other's fame grown dim must yield. Pride is stupid because even if you are the best, you're going to get old and die. You're not always going to be the best. If that's all your hope and trust, you know, you're an Olympic victor, or you're, you've got, you know, your song is number one on the charts, or do they even do that anymore? Um, uh, you, you know, what have you, you're Taylor Swift, whatever. She's going to get old. She's going to get old, and frankly, no one's going to like her anymore if she's not young and pretty and exciting. I will not make a comment on talent or lack thereof, but... You know, you're at the top of the heap. You're not going to be there forever. So, Canto 12, we'll finish off with this. Did anybody find, maybe you looked in the notes. It's totally fine if you did. On page 383 there's and 384, there's something, there's a trick in the poetry. There's a, there's a message communicated in the poetry. Did anybody see the message? Everybody, if you've got your book, turn to page 383. And Dominic, I'm just going to come over here so you can actually see it. The, the people on the video won't, oh, you guys don't have yours either. Okay, 383. So look, look at it. Mark there, mark, mark, mark. Ah, ah. You see it? Ah, ah. Now, 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 then mark, ah, uh, now. What are those M-A-N? Man. It's an acrostic. Man equals pride. In Latin, or in Italian, it's, I don't know how to say it, huom, it's U-O-M. The same thing is in the Italian. It's just a different word for human being, for man. Man is synonymous with being proud. That is mankind's besetting sin, pretty much all of them. And so there's this little acrostic. Because you might have been reading and wondered, why does it say, 
Mark there, Mark on the other, Mark there, Mark Nimrod. Like, that's an odd thing to say. And then suddenly, ah, oh, Niobe, ah, oh, no, ah, oh, Saul, ah, oh, Saul. This is the reign of pride. These are all examples of proud people, many examples, that came to a bad end. Niobe, you probably remember, uh, was a Greek lady who said, I'm so awesome because I've got seven sons and seven daughters. And, you know, Leto, the goddess, she only has uh, Apollo and Artemis. She only has two kids. I'm so much better. Lady, lady, Apollo has the bow that he shoots death arrows at people and Artemis. And, and so she loses all of her children and turns into a statue that just weeps all the time. It's like tears just flood out of the Niobe rock. Um, uh, we have... Um, Oh, let's see. Rehoboam, Solomon's son, who the Israelites came and said, oh, will you make your rule easier than your dad? No, it won't. Tough on you. Lost half the kingdom. Um, Sennacherib, uh, the great Sennacherib Assyrian king who attacked uh, Jerusalem, uh, and his army, you know, 180,000 of his soldiers, died in a single night because the angel of death, the angel of God, went and struck him down. Anyway, he went home, and his sons assassinated him in the temple. Nice. Um, Mark Troy. Ah, Ilion. Now see your hollow shell upon that stone. The culmination is the city of Troy, the great city of Troy that has fallen. Yeah, it's very fun. So it's, he's having a little fun with an acrostic. Um, they set out at the end of Canto um, 12, and as they leave, they get a, um, a beatitude. There's always a beatitude when you leave. This beatitude is, blessed are the poor in spirit. It's the opposite of pride, right? So this is the pattern, right? The whip, the hymn, the song, the rain, and the beatitude, right, when you leave. And so suddenly, Dante, they're leaving the, the gate, you know, they go through the gate, and the angel of the gate, you know, like, brushes him with his wing. And Dante says, geesh, you know, I feel, I feel so much lighter. You know, I feel like I'm able to move. Virgil's like, yeah, yeah, feel your forehead. One of the peas is gone. One of the peccata has been wiped off by the angel. The sin of pride has been wiped out of you. Move along. Um, so that's the pattern. You're going to read Cantos 13 through 22, which I think might be that be fewer Cantos this, this week. Um, and do that imitation, that War of the Worlds imitation. Um, but you're going to see the same thing over and over. Watch for what psalm they sing. They're often in Latin, but you could look it up online, or maybe you know, some of you. Um, look for the whip and the rain, and then look to see what beatitude. Um, see if you can make them out, even if they are in Latin. Pauperes was poor. I mean, pauper. This is a recognizable word in English, so we'll see if you guys can identify them. Otherwise, I will see you next week, and uh, have a good week. <laughs>